The following program is presented by the National Committee on United States-China Relations, www.ncuscr.org. Thank you all for coming. Uh, one of the great pleasures of being with Joan Shea is that we get to host the uh, National Committee from time to time and hear some very interesting speakers organized by the National Committee. And um, I will introduce now the President, uh, Steve Orleans, who I guess it's now 30 or 40 years. No, 30 oh. years. <laughs> I guess it's 30 years that we were colleagues in Beijing. Um, trying to write contracts, um, and most of the time, whatever we wrote, we tore up and threw away during negotiations, but it was a great deal of fun in those early days, As, and Steve will introduce our speakers tonight. Steve? Yeah, we, we, it was 30 years. 30 years. <laughs> you know. And of course, there's, there's some great irony in talking about the internet, because if you think back 30 years ago, in China, you know, when we used to, first of all, I don't know how many people are old enough in the room to remember, we used to communicate with the United States by something called telex. You know, so it was a telex. And if you had to make an outgoing call, this was just in 79, if you had to make an outgoing, a long distance international call, you had to go to the Dien Bao Dalai, you know, the, the, um, uh, the telephone and telegraph office, which was all the way on about the other side of the other side of Tiananmen Square. So you literally would take a taxi or bike or find some way to get over there and and uh, do it. So it was this great irony. That was the way we communicate then, and this is the way we communicate now. Timing is everything. The, the truth, though, is that this idea for this program was created. Um, during a walk along a frozen lake in the Berkshire Mountains in, when was that, in January? When um, Ashley Isaac Mao and I were walking along this, this lake and, and talking about, you know, the Internet and its effect on China's development. I was trying to, you know, because I'm kind of a slightly older, not very older generation, I was trying to learn more about what the effect of this um, was happening on China. And we just uh, what the effect of this was going to be on China, and we decided um, we would have this um, we would have this program. What I didn't know was the media attention that, that we suddenly would learn a new world, a word called Green Dam, and the media attention that is focused on this new um, effort by the Ministry of Information and Industry to regulate. Um, whoops. Everybody turn off their cell phones. <laughs> we'll, um, the, um, their, their attempt to regulate, you know, the Internet. But what we've got today is two of, I, given the subversioning field, I think it's fair to say two of the leading experts in the United States on this field, which would be China and the Internet. It's, it's um, you've got their bio, so I need not repeat um, what is in it, but you can see that each actually has produced a book on media and power in China. And Professor Yang, is, is this book out or about to be out? It, it, it is out, The Power of the Internet in China. So I don't see copies around, though. You have just one. Oh, okay. I was going to say we could have done a book party and, and had all these on, but, um, you know, what we'll do is each of them will speak for around 10 minutes. I'll ask a few questions, and then, um, with, ah, here we are. This is my copy. Autograph? The uh, <laughs> National Committee's having budgetary issues. <laughs> so, um, which of you would like to speak first, I guess, is the question. So, again. Yeah. Okay. I'll turn it over to Professor Yang. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for a generous introduction. Um, I'm delighted and honored to be here. And as uh, Stephen said, uh, there is no better timing for talking about the Internet and politics in China than at this very moment. And Stephen mentioned that uh, there has been this recent media uh, 
uh, coverage about the Green Dam uh, incident. And uh, actually what I think I'm going to do is to use this incident as a case study to illustrate uh, some of the major points, uh, major features of the Internet in China. Um, one thing about uh, studying the Internet in, in, in China is that it's never boring because there are always new things and there, there's always new developments. And uh, this uh, uh, Green Dam uh, issue came right after a more, uh, also another recent incident, which is probably also well known, uh, the so-called grass mud horse. And I think there are some connections between these two incidents. The story itself, the story about the Green Dam, was first reported by the Wall Street Journal on Monday, June 8. According to this story, the Chinese government will require all computers sold in China to pre-install a filtering software called Green Dam and Youth Escort beginning on July the 1st. Two days late, later, major Chinese newspapers confirmed the story. The software developer's web, official website shows that Green Dam has the following seven functions. First, blocking pornography. Second, filtering unhealthy websites. Third, controlling time spent online. Fourth, checking online records. Fifth, restricting online chat. Uh, sixth, administering passwords. And finally, supervising computer gaming. According to a China Daily article on June 10, the software is designed with the good intention of protecting minors from pornography, violence, and other unhealthy content online. Like other governments, the Chinese government has been fighting a losing battle against online pornography. Since June last year, there has been an ongoing national anti-vulgarity campaign to clean the web of unhealthy websites. This Green Dam initiative seems to be the continuation and extension of that campaign. Parents and schools worried about kids spending too much time chatting online and playing games may, wel may welcome this software. Still, the announcement of the new policy draws immediate fire from Internet users in China. Even stories in mainstream media channels in China, like Beijing Daily, Be Beijing Youth Daily, New Beijing Daily, and Taijing Magazine, question this project, viewing it as a possible new step to strengthen control of the Internet. Critics raise the following issues. First, if this software is for protecting minors, why require all computers to be pre-installed with it? Second, the software filters websites based on predefined blacklists of uh, keywords and websites. Who has the authority to blacklist websites? Is the blacklisted website given the right to appeal? Third, there are already other similar softwares in the market. Why are consumers forced to use this one? Fourth, the government paid 40 million Renminbi, about six, 6 million US dollars, to the private software company for one year free use of the software. Through what process was the software company selected? Was the bidding process transparent and fair? In short, criticism focused on consumer rights, the power of the government, and the transparency of the bidding process. In a matter of days, the amount of online protest has turned into a contentious turn, turned this into a contentious internet event in Chinese cyberspace. One of numerous that happened um, in recent years. Now, how to understand uh, this incident, or what uh, does it reveal about uh, the Chinese about the Chinese uh, internet and internet politics? I think there are a number of uh, main, uh, there are a number of points that we can make. I think of this incident as really revealing in, in some very important ways. The first and obvious way is that there has been consistent government effort to control the flux of the web based on the perception that there is much harm there. But the Green Dam Initiative reveals a surprising degree of bluntness in the exercise of government power over the Internet. In recent years, the Chinese government has become more and more sophisticated in the control and the regulation of the Internet. 
after 2004, a stock management approach was adopted. This approach emphasizes stock discipline among consumers and internet businesses and the use of legal rather than administrative power to contain harmful content. The Green Dam Initiative seems to lack such sophistication. It is not clear whether the initiative is introduced because other methods of regulation have, have failed. Second, the Green Dam Incident, I will call it the Green Dam Incident for short, reveals another interesting in characteristic of online politics in China, which is that where there is control, there is resistance. And resistance can be very creative. There are creative methods of undermining control. A good example is the one I mentioned just uh, a, a few minutes ago, the ongoing anti-vulgarity campaign, ostensibly aimed at cleaning the web of pornography and violence, it has led to the closure and tightened censorship of other websites. In response, internet users launched their own anti-anti-vulgarity campaign and in a bemusing move created images of famous classical nude paintings with clothing on. The ultimate product of this anti-anti-vulgarity campaign, which illustrates the creativity of resistance, is the creation of the existing, exist, exceedingly popular new icon of opposition, the grass mud horse. Third, the Green Dam incident reveals that there is a triangle relationship, ambivalent triangle relationship among government, internet businesses, and internet users. It shows, first of all, that private businesses can be recruited for government efforts to control the internet. Indeed, internet users in online forums see Green, uh, green Dam as a good business deal for the software company as much as a control measure. Even before this case, this kind of relationship has caused a great deal of concern about the outsourcing and privatization of control. This incident has put the issue back in public view. There is another kind of relationship between internet businesses and internet users. Internet businesses may not only be recruited for control, those that run websites have a vested interest in maintaining a level of user participation because in the new information economy, user participation means good business. Visiting websites, participating in online discussion, joining online communities, create web traffic, and volumes of web traffic are a major index of business success. That partly explains why, whereas some companies are recruited uh, into the control and regulation of the Internet, others at the same time try to promote contentious activities because contentious activities, interactions in online forums are good business and may uh, pump up the uh, web traffic in their websites. Chinese internet users are active and prolific content producers. This one, uh, one number uh, in a January 2008 survey shows that about 66% of China's 210 million internet users at the time have contributed content to one or more websites. Finally, I want to keep this short so we have time for discussion. The Green, the green Bank case also exposes the inadequacy in government approaches to solving social problems. Suppose Chinese netizens will give the benefit of, of the doubt to the Green Dam Initiative and accept its pronounced goal of protecting minors from pornography and violent content. Will this work? It's probably not likely, according to the arguments made by many uh, users. Many have already tested this, web, uh, this uh, program. The assumption underlying this initiative is that a problem lies in the Internet. Supposedly, if the Internet is contained, everything would be fine. But that won't happen, because the problem is not the Internet. There are lots of unhealthy contents on television and in the streets. One user in Tianyao community wrote in response to this policy that there is a sort of red light district in his neighborhood, and it's right next to a school. Students pass it every day on their way to school. Why doesn't the government do something about it? 
Many users remark that the real unhealthy content feared by the government on the Internet are exposures and protests about government policies and official behavior. But these protests happen frequently offline. The root cause of Internet activism, in other words, are the prevalent social problems in China today. It's not freedom of speech online. So the, the real problem, the real question, I think, uh, interesting question for understanding the Internet is that it's important to tie it to understand in connection to society, to broader social issues, to a community, to, to the market, as well as to politics, you know, and, and then to online activists, to the activities of online activists. What will happen to Green Dam if nothing else it may suffer a similar fate as, as the anti-vulgarity anti campaign. It's already getting its own share of the grass mass force in these online communities when a lot of netizens are really mocking and uh, mocking this, uh, this policy. I think I'll stop here. Thanks very much to Steve uh, for inviting me here, to, uh, to Sarah who arranged for all of the, the, the tickets and everything, and uh, Margot Landon who made everything possible. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's, uh, it, it is a very timely uh, opportunity to talk about issues that I've been thinking about for a really long time. So I almost have a sigh of relief because there's an audience for Sort of uh, issues I've, I've grappled with for some months that I've been working on this book manuscript. When I talked to Steve initially about the presentation that, uh, that I would do down here, uh, he asked me to group my comments uh, around three questions. The first question was, uh, what is the, the kind of the state of development of the Internet in China? And, and what does it mean? What does the popularization of the Internet mean for Chinese society? and in particular for Chinese politics. I'm a political scientist, so I'm sort of uh, inevitably drawn toward political issues. Um, and the second question was, uh, what can we expect over time? Say, over the next five years, uh, how is the Internet likely to change Chinese society, um, economics, uh, or politics? I'm going to focus mostly on politics. Uh, and thirdly, um, how are developments in the Internet going to affect U.S.-China relations? So my comments will be kind of uh, oriented around addressing these three questions. Um, and I, I guess initially, I, I, I want to point out a little bit of, of basic statistics about the Internet. Um, now in China, you have something like 300 million users. This is a body of users that's equivalent to the population of the entire United States. Um, you have 160 million bloggers. That's a lot of bloggers. And these, this is according to government statistics. 160 million people have blogs in China. It's an extraordinary number, uh, especially as a percentage of the entire population of Internet users. And something like 100 million people, the population of Mexico, uses their cell phones to access the Internet. And the number of cell phone users in China is off the charts. It's now estimated at about 650 million. China's like the largest cell phone market in the world. So when we talk about the Internet uh, now, it, it, it's very different from how we, we talked about it five or ten years ago when a tiny minority of the Chinese population was accessing this technology. Times have changed. More than 20% of Chinese are now using the Internet. And it's fundamentally changing people's lives. It's changing the way that they communicate through email, through uh, instant messaging. QQ is a very popular uh, way of, of communicating. It's like uh, an instant messenger that, that people use uh, ubiquitously in China. Um, and, uh, and, and cell phones are also a common way of, of, of communicating, sort of another related type of technology. Um, so with the rise of Internet use, um, people are now accessing all sorts of information uh, that they could not before. Granted, a lot of websites are blocked uh, by the Chinese Communist Party working through the Ministry of Information Industry 
and through local police um, stations around the country. Um, there are estimates that something like 50,000 people are employed uh, in policing the Internet in various ways. Um, so uh, you've got a large body of people who are, who are monitoring what's being said and, and, in a sense, done virtually on the Internet. Um, as a result of the availability of political information, economic information on the Internet, um, uh, the, uh, I, I, I've, I've just been drawn to sort of comparing uh, what you can see in terms of political discourse on the Internet uh, to what you can see in the mainstream media. And uh, as a political scientist of a kind of a positivist bent, uh, I always want to, to have numbers to confirm you know, what, what I'm, I think I'm seeing. So I've done some tests uh, to look at uh, freedom of speech uh, with regard to political subjects uh, on the Internet as, as compared to what you see in mainstream media. And, you know, there's three or four or five times more criticism of high levels of the government uh, on the Internet, um, uh, in blogs in particular, than you would see um, in the mainstream media. Um, there is uh, a lot more debate uh, about a wide variety of topics uh, in blogs, um, and there's an absence of propaganda. So the, the Internet represents uh, an area of the Chinese media system that the Communist Party is having a very difficult time controlling. It's very unaccustomed to not being able to control the media, access by a large segment of the population. So you might imagine that it's incredibly nervous uh, about what freedom of speech, um, if it continues to expand, can mean for the Communist Party's ability to rule China in an unchallenged way. Um, I've, I've also looked at, at sentiment in blogs that, about the advocacy of, of political reform, and over the last few years we've seen a steady trend. More people are advocating democracy, more people are advocating institutional reform, more people are advocating freedom of speech and expression. It's a steady trend, even when you adjust for the increase in the number of people who are accessing the internet in China now. So, uh, it's understandable why the Communist Party, if it believes that controlling the media is the best way to stay in power, will attempt to um, impose a software-like Green Dam on all people who are using PCs to access the Internet. Um, it, uh, there's a social science literature that suggests that uh, the uh, emergence of media freedom in any country is highly correlated with transitions from authoritarian rule. So a rational Chinese Communist Party, if being rational is doing everything you can to stay in power, is not going to allow media freedom. It's not going to allow internet freedom. So that's one finding from a social science literature. Another finding from a social science literature is that um, information freedom is really good for societies and countries around the world. Uh, it's highly correlated with good government, with the absence of corruption. Um, it's um, highly correlated with uh, high levels of economic development. So information freedom is bad for an authoritarian regime, but it's good for almost every society. So the dilemma that Beijing is in now is how much information should it uh, allow um, people in China to have? How much should it restrict? What kind of information should it restrict? Um, and this brings me to the Green Dam uh, phenomenon, which I've, I've just written a, an op-ed about, uh, and I've sent it to the New York Times. Uh, I, I think there's someone from the Washington Post here. Uh, if you're here and you want to speak to me after this talk, <laughs> I'll give it to you. Um, essentially, what I wrote in this op-ed is that um, this attempt to get all computers uh, sold in China uh, to have this software pre-installed is not about uh, uh, protecting uh, the morals of the youth and it's not about you know, cleaning up the internet from smut as much as it's likely to be about control of political subjects. Um, I think this is about what you might call political porn. Um, the masking of and the using of porn to, to mask the aspiration to control political issues rather than about um, actually cleaning up uh, the internet from smut. Uh, and, 
and some people who have tried out the software have found that, in fact, it's not that effective um, at, at barring access to, to pornographic sites. Um, so it, it has some glitches. But, but I think the, the effort to uh, impose Green Dam uh, on all of new PCs sold in China is uh, it, it's kind of an, an effort to, to, to block these spouting holes, if you will, uh, in China's you know, great firewall, its, its system for, for, uh, for controlling Internet freedom. Um, and, and I actually think that, it's, that it's, it's not a good idea for the United States government to, to let, this, um, let this be imposed on, on U.S. computer uh, companies that are, that are selling um, uh, laptops and other computers to China. Of course, uh, it's really difficult for companies themselves to, uh, to resist the pressure that Beijing is now putting on them. Uh, and this is in part because Lenovo, uh, formerly um, uh, IBM, uh, purchased by the Chinese Yanxiang uh, Gongsi Chinese uh, company, um, has agreed, based on a report from Tajin Magazine, to uh, to pre-install the software on all of the machines that it produces for the Chinese market. So, with the major player, you might say, uh, uh, from China, having agreed to uh, pre-install the screen dam, uh, it's going to be hard for HP, another important company selling PCs, to say we're not going to do that. Uh, and you're going to see a situation that's similar to that that Google faced uh, when it was uh, told that it needed to uh, make its search returns comply with restrictions um, of interest to the, the Chinese government. Uh, and, and even Yahoo uh, released information about a dissident uh, named Shita, uh when he was, um, he was um, leaking information about censorship of the, the the June 4th crackdown uh, uh, to uh, human rights organizations in New York. Um, uh, Yahoo uh, provided information about uh, when he accessed his email account. Um, this was used in a legal case against him. He's now serving a long prison sentence. So I, I think that U.S. companies should not uh, uh, join this effort to help the Chinese government control the Internet um, if they can avoid it. But they're under tremendous and pr tremendous pressure to go along. So, in my opinion, this is a time when the government can act. Granted, um, China is a tremendously important country uh, for the United States. We have a, a hugely important economic relationship. We need uh, China's help to deal with uh, the North Korean uh, nuclear ambitions. Um, but we can't agree on everything. And this is one issue that we can, I think, disagree on. Um, and, and currently, the software is to be uh, uh, downloaded, uh, to be pre-installed on, on on all machines. I believe that, that people can de-install the software, but it would be much better if the software was freely available for voluntary download as opposed to mandatory download. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll get off this activist bent for a minute and return to being a social scientist. Um, and, and, and comment on where I think things are headed in the future. Um, the question is, can freedom that we've seen emerge on the Chinese Internet persist? And once freedom emerges on the Internet, the commercial media is inclined to go along uh, uh, with, with kind of the air of openness. If, if the commercial media and the Chinese media in general are tightly restricted and the Internet is free, People are going to stop reading newspapers. They're going to stop watching television. And these commercial entities are going to lose their consumers. So there's a pressure for commercial media to begin to liberalize their content, to be more critical of the state, to champion issues of interest to consumers. Um, so I think there are pressures that are going to push the commercial media to be a little bit freer in China. Now, the liberalization, if it continues, um, is likely to change the, the political uh, situation. Uh, and and it, it's hard to say that, that a, a liberalization, an increase of freedom of speech in a country that's currently authoritarian is going to be a peaceful thing. Um, um, there's an argument in political science that suggests that um, liberalizing countries are often warlike countries. Um, and we've seen a lot of uh, nationalism uh, on the Chinese internet. Um, there was a CNN commentator who made some loose remarks about the quality of Chinese leaders, and, and he was attacked 
um, by uh, Chinese Internet users. Uh, a subsequent study done by um, a scholar at, uh, in Hong Kong, Dave Van Dursky, showed that, that many of the people who had, had attacked to this commentary were, in fact, um, party members, known as 50 cent party members, um, who uh, were, were acting at the behest of, of their party leadership um, to, to attack um, CNN, and this then spread to you know, uh, the larger internet discourse. Uh, so, so nationalism is, is something that I think we're likely to see. But, but when I look into the future, I just see more, uh, really, more communication, more access to information, more opportunities for understanding China. Uh, while many of our websites are available to Chinese, many Chinese websites are available to, to scholars who read Chinese. You know, I was able to read the document uh, pertaining to Green Dam uh, as soon as it was reported uh, in the Western media and posted on some blogs. So it's, it's, it's easy for people with language abilities to understand China, and I think many more Chinese are developing the English language ability that enables them to understand developments in America. So I think we're, we're facing a period of increased uh, possibility for understanding, but also potentially misunderstanding. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think that, that freedom is necessarily uh, going to be uh, specific. Uh, uh, you know, uh, as China moves toward a more liberal society, which I think it will do, um, there are chances that, 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 um, that the U.S. will clash with China. Um, and social organizations um, are increasingly empowered in China, and I think U.S. organizations are increasingly active in China. Um, you, you may see more friction, um, but hopefully um, the, uh, the, the quality of the relationship and the extent of common interest that the U.S. and China have uh, and the positive impact of the Internet is going to trump uh, any negative impact it may have in empowering nationalists. And I tend to be optimistic that this uh, technology is going to uh, make U.S.-China relations better, it's going to empower citizens in China, and it's going to create uh, a, more, a more liberal and an open-minded state. Thank you.